1992, a young mother was gunned down in front of her children. Police searched for answers but found nothing. Then family members offered a startling clue. It would take local and federal agents to untangle an intricate web of money, drugs, and murder to capture the architects of a heartbreaking crime. Two young boys were the only witnesses to their mother's murder. The horrible crime appeared unmotivated, senseless, and random. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. The victim, the wife of a prominent Atlanta attorney, was also a woman burdened with a secret. The FBI believed that secret led to her death. They hoped its discovery would also lead to her killer. November 29th, 1992, Atlanta, Georgia. Travelers returned home at the end of the Thanksgiving holiday. 39-year-old Sarah Tokars and her two children had spent the long weekend with her parents in Florida. Her husband, a well-known lawyer and judge, was away on business. After a nine-hour drive, they arrived safely in their suburban Atlanta neighborhood of Marietta. The house was dark as they pulled into the driveway. But it was not empty. Sarah did not see a man waiting in the shadows of the garage. He brandished a weapon. The gunman forced Sarah back into the SUV. The terrified woman had a six-year-old at her side and a four-year-old still asleep in the car. She had no choice. The man put his gun to Sarah's head and told her to drive towards the city. She followed instructions. As they reached an empty development, he told her to turn off. She refused. She pleaded with him to let her children go. with a single gunshot to her head. As the gunman grabbed her purse and fled, the vehicle kept rolling. The children still inside. When it came to a stop, Sarah's six-year-old son had to reach across his mother's body to turn off the ignition. He unbuckled his groggy four-year-old brother from his car seat then ran to the nearest house. There, a neighbor called 911. Officers responded to the report of a possible homicide in the vicinity of Powers Road. Cobb County Police were dispatched immediately. Homicide detectives arrived as officers fanned out to search for the gunman. Police briefed them on the spot. The two young boys who witnessed the shooting identified the victim as their mother, Sarah Tokars. Their father, Fred Tokars, was out of town. Police were already trying to contact him. 
Forensic technicians examined the vehicle where it had stopped. There might be trace evidence outside as well as inside the car. An analysis confirmed what the boys had told police. The gunman was sitting directly behind Sarah Tokar's when he pulled the trigger. Blood spatter pattern suggested he had used a shotgun. Detectives knew it would be difficult to get detailed information from children so young, especially after such a traumatic experience. The oldest one, six years old, would try his best. He said the killer was a black male, wearing jeans, a sweatshirt, and a cap. He could not be more specific. The boy didn't know which way the killer had run after he grabbed his mother's purse. But he said the weapon looked like a pirate's gun that you would see on TV. Detectives were not sure what he meant. Maybe the autopsy would tell them more. Detectives tracked down relatives living in the area to take custody of the boys until their father could be located. Police learned the family's address by running the plates on the vehicle. They continued the investigation at the Tokar's home where the abduction had occurred. In the living room, they found a security dowel lying next to a sliding glass door. The killer had likely entered the house here. The home security system had not been activated. All right here, let's get some photographs. No alarm sounded as the intruder entered. And then after that, I want you to go ahead and process it. Perhaps a burglar had taken advantage of the lax security, and Sarah surprised him when she returned home. Whoever the burglar was, he hadn't left any trace evidence at the Tokar's home. There was little to go on, according to Cobb County Chief Detective Arthur Allred. At this point, we just really didn't know what happened. Uh, this was uh, in a upper middle class neighborhood. Uh, this was a, uh, a, a a mother with her two children, and this kind this type of crime was just just didn't occur in this area at all. Uh, the most serious crime we had probably be vandalism. Uh, so initially, uh, we were really baffled as as to what had happened and, wh and why. Sarah's eldest son worked with a police sketch artist and described the man in the dark who had killed his mother. The drawing of a thin black man wearing a knit hat was released to the public. But the six-year-old's description was too vague to elicit any viable leads. The victim's husband, Fred Tokars, was contacted at his hotel in Montgomery, Alabama. He returned to Atlanta immediately. As a criminal defense attorney, Tokars was aware he would be considered an early suspect in his wife's murder. He had his own attorney present when he spoke to authorities. They quickly established his alibi so police could pursue more promising leads. Detectives confirmed that at the time of the murder, Fred Tokars was in Alabama. He had been visiting a client incarcerated in the Montgomery jail. The grieving husband assured police that he and Sarah had a strong marriage. He would do anything he could to help find her killer. Tokars agreed to walk detectives through the house. As far as he knew, the doors were locked and the security rod was in place when he left for Montgomery. 
He explained that they had intentionally left the alarm off because a plumber was scheduled to fix the hot water heater over the weekend. Tokars led detectives to the basement where he kept his home office. He said he usually had about $1,500 locked in the safe. Now it was open and empty. I did keep some cash in there. Its combination was hidden in a nearby file. Only he and his wife knew it was there. Perhaps Sarah had taken the money on her trip to Florida. It was also possible that the burglar had found the combination and taken the cash. Ultimately, Tokars couldn't specify how much money, if any, was missing. To police, nothing else in the house seemed disturbed, and no clues pointed to the killer's identity. A lot of people were frightened. Uh, a lot of people were just couldn't believe that this would happen to a mother in front of her children, and especially in the neighborhood where it occurred. So there was a lot of... Uh, 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 a lot of pressure on the department to, to, to find who had killed her. Police hoped the coroner's report would give them more. Lab examiners confirmed that Sarah Tokers had been killed with a 410 shotgun. To a child, if that type of weapon had been sawed off, it might look like a 17th century flintlock pistol used by pirates on TV. Only the plastic wadding and buckshot were recovered from the SUV. It might be a 410 or maybe a 20 gauge. Because no shell casing had been ejected, they would not be able to match anything to a specific weapon if one were later found. Maybe 410. The examiner discovered no foreign hairs, fibers, or fingerprints on the body or clothing. The anonymous killer had left nothing that could lead investigators to his identity. Former assistant United States attorney Buddy Parker, like many members of the Atlanta community, was stunned by the news of the murder. We had a discussion uh, that morning about the notoriety of the homicide, of it being the wife of Fred Tokars, who was known uh, within the legal community, uh, having been a former assistant district attorney for Fulton County. Uh, I was familiar with uh, Fred Tokars in his role as a criminal defense lawyer in a matter that was then pending in our office, a matter regarding um, the investigation of a particular drug dealer. Fred Tokar's lucrative criminal defense practice brought him into contact with many men accused of federal drug charges. Rarely does such a murder have a simple motive. Solving the case would not be easy. The following day, two women came to the Cobb County Police Station. Sarah Tokar's sister and her cousin had a file they needed to show detectives. Sarah had entrusted her sister with the file three years earlier. At the time, Sarah made her promise to take it to police if anything ever happened to her. It contained what appeared to be lists of Fred Tokar's bank accounts and their balances. The women suggested that the papers might be related to Sarah's attempt to divorce Fred. Her sister's marriage was not as strong as Fred had led police to believe. Sarah wanted a divorce, but whenever she broached the subject, he threatened to use his legal connections to get sole custody of their children. Sarah was trapped. If she ever hoped to divorce Fred and keep her children, she needed leverage. After the incident, Sarah had secretly copied some of Fred's files and gave them to her sister for safekeeping. She suspected they outlined illegal activities he might be involved in. If that were so, they could be her only leverage against him in court. Investigators reviewed the files carefully. 
Perhaps they would help police determine whether Sarah Tokar's death was a botched robbery or a carefully planned conspiracy. Cobb County detectives called the FBI office in Atlanta for help. They hoped that Special Agent Michael Twibel could determine if Fred Tokar's bank statements were somehow linked to the murder. We were contacted by the Cobb County authorities uh, concerning the documents they had discovered, which were brought to them by uh, Sarah Tokar's sister and cousin, which revealed that Mr. Tokar's her husband had been involved in setting up offshore bank accounts and offshore corporations. It would take time for Agent Twibel and his team to unravel the names and finances on those documents to see if they had something or nothing to do with the death of Sarah Tokars. On December 3, 1997, four days after the shooting, Sarah Tokars was laid to rest. Her two children were left motherless. Investigators still had no leads that pointed to the identity of her killer. Whoever had killed the young mother was still out on the streets. Just after Thanksgiving in 1997, the FBI and local investigators continued their search for the lone gunman who shot and killed Sarah Tokars, the wife of a prominent Atlanta attorney, in front of her two young children. Sarah's six-year-old child had given a vague description of the suspect to police in Cobb County, Georgia, but they still had no solid leads. Copies of her husband's bank statements were sent to the FBI field office in Atlanta for closer scrutiny. Special Agent Michael Twibel hoped to provide insight as to whether the documents might somehow be connected to Sarah Tokar's murder. Once we reviewed these documents, it revealed that Mr. Tokars had set up offshore banks and corporations, not only in the Turk and Caicos, but in Montserrat and in the Bahamas. Uh, these documents also showed that he had set up numerous corporations and nominees' names in the Atlanta, Georgia area. Nominees are people who, in name only, head dummy corporations for purposes of money laundering. Although Fred Tokars had never been accused of money laundering himself, he was an expert on the subject. Buddy Parker, a former assistant U.S. attorney, was aware that Tokars was not only a well-known lawyer, he was also a certified public accountant. Fred Tokars was known within the Atlanta legal community as uh, a person who held himself out to be uh, an expert in uh, money laundering uh, and in fact conducted uh, lectures for law enforcement authorities uh, at the state level uh, on money laundering. Investigating the finances of a man like Fred Tokars would be a delicate business. He was well-liked and well-connected among Atlanta's power elite. He was well-known in Cobb County. He was also well-known in uh, political circles in as much as he had been appointed as an assistant municipal court judge and he had been an assistant uh, solicitor for Fulton County. He had uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, friends in high political places and helped on numerous campaigns uh, of, of state and local uh, officials. Uh, wondering if you have any uh, investigators again met with Tokars so and his attorney. Kind of you, uh, they told him they believed his business dealings could be connected to his wife's killing and asked him about his clients. Has your wife mentioned anything to you about anyone that she Fred Tokars admitted several were violent drug dealers who operated in dangerous circles. One in particular was reputed to have been a major cocaine supplier in the Atlanta area. The dealer had returned home to Detroit after another one of Tokar's clients had allegedly forced him out of the South.
Not long after, he was gunned down in front of his mother's home. The murder weapon, a handgun found later in a nearby alley, had been traced back to a gun shop north of Atlanta. Tokar suggested that the dealer's remaining crew, or even those who murdered him, could have had Sarah killed to send a message to the lawyer. We can arrange something and get it over to you. Detectives secured a warrant to search the attorney's office to see if they could find any link to the killer in his papers. That night, local investigators and IRS agents conducted a thorough search of the office. They confiscated files, date books, and business calendars dating back several years, but found no direct clues to the murder. In the margins of Tokar's date books, agents did find notations of offshore accounts. The total deposited in these accounts far exceeded the amount Tokar's claimed on his taxes each year. It looked as if Fred Tokars had used his expertise in money laundering to his own financial advantage. Local and federal officials met with representatives of the Atlanta United States Attorney's Office. They suspected Fred Tokars' illegal activities went far beyond money laundering. Money laundering was already on our radar screen, if you will. Secondly, now we have evidence coming out of the Tokar's home of offshore bank accounts. With those two clear facts, uh, we felt that there was a firm basis to open an investigation formally on Fred Tokar's. Parker learned that in August of 1992, the DEA had arrested one of Tokar's clients in a sting operation. His name was Anthony Brown. Brown had a reputation as a cocaine dealer in Atlanta. The day before, agents had intercepted one of his couriers in Texas and seized more than 100 kilos of cocaine. Inside the trunk of Brown's car, agents found $50,000 in cash. They also found documents revealing Fred Tokars was more than Brown's defense attorney. He had incorporated an Atlanta nightclub for the drug dealer. It was believed by law enforcement that the nightclub was a front to help launder the drug proceeds of the drug trafficking organization that Brown was a member of. DEA agent Jeff Dahlman had participated in the sting operation to arrest Brown. Parker hoped Dahlman's drug trafficking case would help with the murder investigation. What had happened as a result of the homicide of Mrs. Tokars was that the light got turned on Fred Tokars' past of what, what he had been doing for the past several years. And what was illuminated was that he'd been involved with several drug traffickers in the Atlanta area. Investigators wondered how deep that involvement went. Police re-interviewed Tokars' neighbors to see if they had missed anything. If on One close friend confirmed that Sarah wanted to divorce her husband, but she was afraid of him. Not long before she was murdered, Sarah confided that she had found some of her husband's documents that seemed suspicious. According to the neighbor, Sarah said these weren't simply lists of offshore accounts. They were stronger proof of criminal activities. About a week and a half before Sarah Tokars' uh, murder, uh, Sarah Tokars uh, explained to her uh, that she now had the goods on Fred, that she had found documents or records that indicated he had engaged in or was engaging in tax evasion, and that she, uh, she was going to go to the authorities with this information and she could then get a divorce. If Sarah had confronted her husband with the evidence, it might have motivated him to harm her. Investigators additionally found the name of a Tokar's private investigator. The PI admitted to agents that Tokar's had hired him to approach drug dealers about laundering their profits. 
he was listed as one of the owners, along with Fred Tokars, of another Atlanta nightclub, according to Special Agent Michael Twible. We determined that he was an owner of a company, but through our further investigation, we realized that he was a nominee. And when I say the word nominee, I mean the fact that he was delegated to the person being legally responsible as being an owner of the club, but he, in actuality, he was not. Fred Tokars had constructed the entire scheme. According to the private eye, Tokars courted reputed drug dealers like Anthony Brown, men who had a lot of cash, but no place to invest it without raising suspicions of the IRS. Tokars, a money laundering expert, proposed depositing their drug profits in offshore accounts and in businesses like clubs that operated primarily on a cash basis. The money could then be filtered through legitimate financial institutions. And the way you would launder the money is even though it's dealt in, in cash, you would pay entertainers on paper $15,000 when in actuality you paid them $5,000 cash. Tokars would receive thousands for each transaction. He was actively involved knowing that these people were drug traffickers and what they were doing with their money. The object was to open corporations, mainly nightclubs, cash businesses where they could easily hide their assets, where they could easily run their drug proceeds through them. Authorities believe the connection between Fred Tokars and drug traffickers had somehow led to his wife's murder. But the details were elusive. Not. Get back in that car now. Weeks no. after the murder of Sarah Tokars, a man capable of murdering an innocent mother in front of her children remained at large. Got a shotgun blast in the back of the By December 1992, several weeks after Sarah Tokars was killed, federal and state authorities had still not found the lone gunman and still had no clues to his identity. Shortly before she was brutally murdered, Sarah believed she had discovered papers in her husband's law office that documented his illegal activities. Former U.S. prosecutor Buddy Parker believed that Sarah had likely threatened to expose Fred Tokars with those documents unless he agreed to a divorce. That began to give us a feeling that uh, Sarah Tokars was murdered to keep her mouth shut about her knowledge or her belief about her husband's role and involvement in laundering drug money for drug traffickers. Fred Tokars not only represented violent drug dealers, he had gone into business with them. Investigators now had evidence Tokars' clients were laundering money through several nightclubs. If his wife had threatened to expose him, Tokars, as well as his clients, had a lot to lose. The FBI took a hard look at the nightclubs the attorney had incorporated. Special Agent Michael Twible had to wade through piles of state records, searching for a name that could link Tokars directly to the murder. We started reviewing uh, company and corporation records and uh, liquor license and business license that uh, Mr. Tokars had incorporated. We started looking at these different clubs uh, to see actually who owned them. Major drug suppliers like Al Brown contributed the funds. A middleman purchased the clubs. And Tokar set up the entire deal, as DEA agent Jeff Dolman discovered. They didn't really trust Mr. Tokar to launder money in offshore bank accounts. It was too elaborate. They wanted their money where they could touch it, where they could feel it, where they could use it every day, where they could buy cars with it. And so the, the laundering, in essence, in this investigation turned towards the laundering of money through nightclubs, through incorporation of the nightclubs. FBI agents interviewed employees of the nightclubs. Over time, they were able to piece together the structure of the business, its owners, and its profits. 
to attorney Parker, it was like assembling a complex puzzle. The picture of how uh, the night cub money laundering was structured was really developed through insiders, through inside drug traffickers who ultimately decided to cut plea agreements with us and to cooperate and provide evidence. But nothing from the nightclubs pointed to Sarah Tokar's killer. After months of frustration, Cobb County Police finally got a break. A detective working on the case got a tip from his brother, a deputy in nearby Fulton County. The deputy remembered seeing Fred Tokar's name in the file for a businessman who had an outstanding arrest warrant. The businessman's name was Eddie Lawrence, wanted for writing bad checks on one of Tokar's accounts. Of all Tokar's business associates and clients, Eddie Lawrence was a name he had never mentioned to police. Authorities quickly learned that Eddie Lawrence and Fred Tokars were involved in several businesses together. These included construction, renovation, and mortgage companies. Tokars had also defended Lawrence in several minor brushes with the law. It was a long shot, but it was the only lead they had left. Eddie Lawrence had, through Fred Tokars, been granted access to some of the uh, some of the uh, most prominent individuals within the city. Uh, Fred would take Eddie to some of the big political fundraising functions, and and all of a sudden Eddie was, like I said, he's very presentable. He he could certainly uh, mingle and 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 uh, not be embarrassed at cocktail functions and things, and and engage in conversations and. And so he, he was living this wonderful life, and the way he got there was through Fred Tokars. A few days later, the young businessman agreed to questioning after police discovered records of calls between he and Tokars on the day of the murder. Eddie Lawrence said he had been in business with Fred Tokars for almost a year. He claimed the phone calls were all job-related. He knew nothing about Sarah Tokar's murder. The detectives had Lawrence arrested on the bad check charge and then released him on bond. They wanted to see which one of Tokar's associates got nervous when they heard Lawrence was being investigated. The plan worked. The confidential informant contacted police. The word on the street was that Eddie Lawrence had been looking for a hitman prior to Sarah Tokar's murder. He had pressured one of his employees to help him find someone to kill a woman who he claimed stood in the way of a lot of money. The employee gave Lawrence a name, Curtis Rower. Rower was a drug addict with a long rap sheet including armed robbery. He needed money. Maybe he'd be interested. Although the informant didn't mention Fred Tokars by name, investigators finally had a potential link between the victim's husband, Eddie Lawrence, and a hitman. Detectives interviewed Eddie Lawrence. No, I deny. They questioned him about his relationship with Tokars. Why would I have somebody he claimed no involvement in the murder. When I had nobody else. Police felt he was lying. On December 16th, 1992, police detained Lawrence and revoked his bail because of the flight risk. They wanted him in custody when they went after Curtis Rower. Detectives immediately secured search and arrest warrants for a house in College Park where Rower was staying. They proceeded with caution. If Rower was capable of killing an innocent woman in cold blood, there was no telling what he might do when cornered.
On December 22nd, 1992, three weeks after a mother of two was murdered, Cobb County police circled a home in College Park to arrest suspected hitman Curtis Rower. The woman who answered the door said she wasn't sure if Rower was home. An initial sweep of the house produced nothing. Still, they kept up their guard. One officer thought he heard movement in a bedroom. It was Curtis Rower. He was unarmed. Lay down, all the way down. Spread your hands out. Keep them spread. Rower was booked and charged with murder. He claimed that Eddie Lawrence, Fred Tokar's business partner, had offered him $5,000 to kill Sarah Tokars, but Rower was too scared to go through with it. He said Lawrence was the one who had caused Sarah's death. Rower admitted that he had carjacked the family. But when Sarah Tokars stopped, he said that he couldn't pull the trigger. At that moment, Eddie Lawrence ran up to the car, screaming for Rower to shoot. Lawrence grabbed the shotgun and it went off, killing Sarah Tokars. Both men then fled in Lawrence's car. Though police believed Rower was downplaying his role, Sarah's six-year-old son was the only other witness they had to refute his claim. He remembered only one shooter. The boy would be forced to identify the man who terrorized his family from a lineup unless Eddie Lawrence corroborated Rower's story. Authorities charged Eddie Lawrence with conspiracy to commit murder, but Lawrence refused to confirm or deny Rower's statement. Hello? Cobb yes. County Police notified Fred Tokars that Eddie Lawrence and Curtis Rower had been formally charged with his wife's murder. He received the news at Sarah's parents' house in Florida, where he was vacationing with his sons for the holidays. Who was on the phone? It's the police. They have arrested someone for the murder. So. Ah, thank God for that. His relatives later said that while the rest of the family expressed relief, Fred Tokars did not. He seemed despondent. The arrests of Lawrence and Rower had made national headlines. Tokars was caught in that same spotlight and refused to give any statements to the press. Because the suspected hitman's story conflicted with Tokars' son's version, the six-year-old was asked to view a suspect lineup. Police explained that though he would be able to see five men staring at him, they would not be able to see him. The one-way mirror would prevent that. When the child said he was ready, investigators called for the men. All of them resembled the boy's description of his mother's killer. Detectives reassured him that he could take as much time as he needed. But it was no use. The child was either too young or too frightened to remember the killer's face. When relatives tried to reach Fred Tokars in Florida to inform him, he was nowhere to be found. Fred left the company of his in-laws and returned to his, his hotel room uh, where uh, no one heard from him. And the following morning, they tried to uh, 
raise him on the telephone. They tried to find him, and there were no responses. Concerned, Sarah's father rushed to the hotel where Tokars was staying. Fred! 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 Fred Tokars had swallowed a handful of sleeping pills and washed it down with beer. The manager of the hotel quickly called an ambulance. He had uh, apparently attempted to take his life after hearing that, that Eddie Lawrence, uh, uh, this, this uh, business partner of his, uh, had been arrested for the murder of his, of his wife. Sarah's father found a note written in Fred Tokar's handwriting on the table beside the bed. In the locked hotel room, Fred Tokars wrote a long, rambling note, apologizing for the pain and suffering his lifestyle had inflicted upon his family. He wrote that Sarah was a great woman. Then on the day before Christmas Eve, Fred Tokars swallowed a handful of sleeping pills, enough to kill him. Fred Tokars lay on the bed, barely breathing. If he died, the truth about his wife's murder might die with him. Come on, Fred. Yes, yes, there's been emergency. In late December of 1992, Fred Tokars, the once prominent Atlanta attorney now suspected in his wife's murder, lay motionless in a Florida hotel room from an overdose of sleeping pills. He was rushed to a nearby hospital where they were able to revive him. Um, thank you for coming down today. Uh, After his release, he held a press conference. A really, uh, tough time for myself and also for my children. He told the public that he was very depressed and that the media was not making it easy. We did this terrible crime. Tokars had gone to the extent of establishing residency in Florida to avoid the attention. But he believed that justice would soon be served. The FBI believed justice would soon be served as well. Convinced that Fred Tokars had used his business associate, Eddie Lawrence, to hire a hitman to kill Fred's wife, Sarah, the team of federal and local investigators would use federal racketeering statutes known as RICO to prosecute Tokars. Building a RICO case to prove Sarah Tokars had been killed to protect her husband's illegal activities meant outlining those activities in detail. The RICO statute, it attacks basically this conspiracy of individuals who are out committing all types of different crimes, not necessarily together, but they're all for the benefit of this, of this criminal group to exist, to continue to exist, and to make money. Looks like things are coming together a federal grand jury named Tokars as an unindicted co-conspirator in the homicide. Though Tokars' partner, Eddie Lawrence, had remained silent after seven months in prison, investigators hoped the public indictment might encourage Lawrence to testify against Tokars. Not long after, the Atlanta U.S. Attorney's Office received a phone call that Eddie Lawrence was ready to cooperate in exchange for sentencing consideration. Got some work to do. For Lawrence's long-awaited statement, investigators secured a remote location in Georgia that would be monitored by chopper surveillance. DEA agent Jeff Dahlman was part of the team that needed to make sure nothing went wrong. We were there before Mr. Lawrence was brought in. Uh, his location had been kept a secret from everybody involved. Uh, the only people uh, that knew of where Mr. Lawrence was actually being held at that time were the Cobb County Police Department. Mr. Lawrence at that time was a key witness in this investigation, and his safety was paramount to everyone. Inside a fortified house, Eddie Lawrence told investigators that he and Tokars were not just partners in the construction business. 
They were also involved in laundering drug money. Lawrence told FBI Special Agent Michael Twibel the details of the scheme. Mr. Tokar wanted him to try to solicit drug clients in the various nightclubs and bring them to him so he could launder their money. And in turn also set up Eddie Lawrence into several businesses. Lawrence owed his success to Tokars. He also owed the attorney $70,000 in business debts. Fred Tokars approached Eddie Lawrence indicating that, you know, that Sabre now was going to try to divorce him and take everything he had and he wasn't going to let that happen and he couldn't afford to allow her to do that to him and he wanted her killed. Lawrence refused initially. Although he had been involved in drug dealing, he had never been involved in murder. Mr. Lawrence said, well, just let her have the house and the kids and the cars. And Mr. Tokar said, I've worked so hard, I'm not going to let her have it. Lawrence said that Tokar's planned the murder for several months. His first idea was to have Sarah shot in his office, but decided the couple's home was a better location. Tokar's was to pay Lawrence $25,000 for the hit. Mr. Lawrence advised that Mr. Tokars wanted to be out of town and that for Mr. Lawrence to commit the murder uh, as a burglary, basically uh, in front of his children, uh, which is very unusual. He told Mr. Lawrence that the kids would get over it, that they're young, and it wouldn't bother them saying that their mother was murdered. Lawrence admitted he didn't have the nerve to kill an innocent woman, so he hired Curtis Rohr. After Rohr shot Sarah Tokars, Lawrence drove him away from the scene. Since he cooperated, Lawrence earned 12 and a half years for his part in setting up the murder. The hitman he hired, Curtis Rohr, was sentenced to life without parole. For the time being, Tokars was still a free man. Mr. Tokars had custody of his two children. Our concern um, during this time and the rest of Mr. Tokars was that there could be some harm done to the children. And Mr. Tokars was, uh, was aware that he'd been watched, the media, was still down in Florida at the time. He knew that people were watching him daily, and we had to develop a plan to get Mr. Tokars out of the house where there'd be no harm done to the children or to himself, and, and try to affect the arrest. The agents knew Tokars hated the press. They posed as reporters lurking around the condo, hoping to elicit a response from the wanted man. And the game plan at that time was to have Mr. Tokar come out and check us out, which he had done previously to other people that had been parked in the area. The plan worked well. He came downstairs. He called the police. Local officers arrived, aware of the ruse. Fred Tokars emerged from his condo to file a complaint. Instead, he was arrested. Fred Tokars pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. But separate state and federal juries found him guilty of racketeering, money laundering, murder for hire, and murder. He was sentenced to four life terms with no chance of parole for elevating his greed beyond the life of his wife and children. He will never be free again. In the fall of 1995, a serial killer was on the loose. Crossing the country, 
he lured women with his charm and then struck. Each time, he vanished before police could catch him. The FBI and police detectives needed to stop him before another victim met this deadly stranger. The body of a young woman found burned in a truck launched a manhunt to find her killer. When more bodies began to turn up across the country, the FBI believed the cases were linked. Investigators had a suspect. They just couldn't find him. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. Agents would enlist the help of local law enforcement and even long-haul truckers to stop a cross-country killer. In the early morning hours of September 29, 1995, the Los Angeles Fire Department responded to a vehicle fire at a hospital in Van Nuys. They found a pickup truck burning in the parking lot. When the flames were extinguished, they found human remains. Firemen contacted the Arson and Homicide Division of the Los Angeles Police Department. Homicide detectives responded to the scene and were briefed by uniformed officers already there. They questioned a witness, a nurse who had seen the fire start. She said she had arrived for work before dawn for the early morning shift. In the parking lot, she saw the truck go ablaze. She saw the outline of a figure with long hair run from the truck as the flames erupted. She never saw a face. And she had never seen the truck before. Investigators inspected the vehicle. The pattern of fire damage indicated it had begun in the cab and had burned very quickly. Investigators believed it had been intentionally set. An accelerant had been used, probably gasoline. The body inside appeared to be a female, but it was burned beyond recognition. Some items survived the fire, including a backpack, a camera, and a roll of undeveloped film. Technicians recovered several documents that bore the name Sandra Gallagher. By sunrise, detectives at LAPD's Van Nuys station had run the truck's plates. Okay, I'll, I'll call back. Through DMV records, Detective Mike Koblenz was able to confirm that Sandra Gallagher owned the truck. We'd done some work at the office and learned that uh, she was, in fact, married to uh, an individual, Steve, who lived in the Los Angeles area. We attempted to contact him and made arrangements to interview him at uh, Van Nuys Station. Detectives suspected it was Sandra in the truck, but identification through dental records would take a few days. I have some things I want you to look at. Since the body was too damaged to identify, detectives asked Stephen Gallagher to look through the recovered evidence. He said the backpack, camera, and other items were Sanders. The police department had developed a roll of film that survived the fire. 
wife and somebody Stephen else. identified his wife in the pictures. Most married homicide victims are killed by their husbands. We were having a few problems. We Detectives were asked Stephen about his relationship with Sandra. There's a lot of domestic violence, spousal abuse that goes on, so it's, it's, it's just a, a, a direction to go to initially. In our case, as it related to Sandra Gallagher, uh, once again, we wanted to eliminate the husband as a suspect and determine a little bit more about our victim, Sandra. Stephen said he had seen his wife on September 28th, the day before the truck fire. That day, the couple had met for lunch. He and Sandra were experiencing marital problems, and they had spent the last couple of nights apart. They had talked about reconciling. But things were still strained between them. Okay. Stephen told detectives he last saw Sandra around 2 p.m., though he heard from his wife later that evening. He said Sandra called him from a local bar called McGrath's. I know, I know. She was very excited and told him she had won $1,200 in the lottery. Since that call, Stephen hadn't heard from his wife and had no idea where she had gone. There are a few other people. Uh, Detectives had to corroborate his story. Once he mentioned the bar McReds, that was our direction. We wanted to get in there, find out who was the bartender, who the owner was, who was there that particular evening, and who could identify some photos of Sandra that we'd gathered from the truck. LAPD detectives visited the bar. When shown a photo of Sandra Gallagher, the bartender recognized the woman. What can you tell me about it? She knew her by her nickname, Sam. Had a lottery ticket. Hey. Guess what? The bartender confirmed that Sandra had been in the bar on the night of the 28th. She had told everyone about her lottery win. Yeah. Some customers overheard the detective's questions and said they had also been in McGred's that evening. Can you tell me about her when she was in here the other night? They also remembered Sandra and recalled one man who talked with her that night. These people in the bar had mentioned to us that uh, they recognized the photographs and they identified the photographs as a female by the name of Sam. This is the uh, name that they knew her by, was Sam. And everybody had mentioned she was with a person by the name of Glenn. Yeah. They described Glenn as having long blonde hair and a beard. He'd been coming in regularly for the past few days. That night, he seemed interested in Sandra and talked to her for quite a while. Okay. Glenn was friendly and came across as a big spender, buying drinks for Sandra and the others. When the bar closed, Glenn had asked Sandra for a ride home. He said he lived nearby. She agreed to drop him off, and they left together. The customers hadn't seen Glenn since that night. Yeah, she took him home. Do you know where he lives? They believed Glenn's last name was Rogers, but they weren't sure. Their description of him matched the one of the man seen fleeing the burning truck. If you think of anything else, please call me. Detective Koblenz would check the lead. Through department sources, we were able to identify Glenn Rogers as a resident in the Van Nuys area. And we were able to obtain photographs of Mr. Rogers. These photographs, in the next day or two, were shown to various witnesses at the bar in the form of a photo lineup. 
and Mr. Rogers was identified in this photo lineup as the person being at McRed's with Sandra Gallagher. Detectives secured a search warrant for Rogers' apartment. It was only a few minutes away from where the truck had been burned. LAPD, search warrant! They didn't know if Rogers was inside, perhaps with a weapon. Uniformed officers entered first to clear the apartment. Rogers wasn't there. It looked like Rogers had cleared out in a hurry. Detectives recovered a purse and a woman's wallet. It was empty of cash and held no ID. No identification. They also found a woman's earring. The earring became significant in that uh, her husband, Steve Gallagher, identified that earring as one that he had purchased as a pair for uh, his wife a couple months earlier. After several days, the coroner made his report. He positively identified the remains from the truck as those of Sandra Gallagher. He determined that she had not burned to death. We learn in the nose area of our victim, there wasn't any presence of evidence of fire, sooting, and so on. That gave us information that uh, because she didn't breathe any of the fire, any of the soot, it gave us an indication that uh, she had died prior to the fire itself. The mother of three had been killed by manual strangulation. Los Angeles detectives charged Glenn Rogers with Sandra Gallagher's murder and issued a warrant for his arrest. They entered Rogers' name and description into the NCIC, the National Crime Information Center, a database that links over 57,000 law enforcement agencies nationwide. That informs other agencies around the United States that Glenn Rogers, in this case, is in fact wanted in Los Angeles for murder, it would list the agency, Los Angeles Police Department, Van Nuys area, with my name and my phone number. If they have any contact with Glenn Rogers and happen to run him, this warrant would show up uh, in their jurisdiction and he'd be taken into custody. Detectives sought out anyone who knew Glenn Rogers. They learned he frequented local bars and worked odd jobs, mostly in construction. They visited several job sites, interviewing his friends and co-workers. Through witnesses and friends, we learned that Glenn uh, did have a temper, and that when he drank, he did become enraged. There was domestic uh, violence involved with uh, former girlfriends. So we knew we were dealing with someone who could become violent, and generally violent when he drank, as it was in our case with Sandra Gallagher. One of his friends said he hadn't seen Rogers in a while, but promised to contact the police if he heard from him. Okay. A few days later, Rogers' friend called. He said Rogers had phoned him from a motel outside Jackson, Mississippi. Local police talked to the motel manager who told them Rogers' room number. Open up. The room was empty. The murder suspect was on the run. In the fall of 1995, the search continued for Glenn Rogers. Police believed he fled California after killing a woman there on September 28th. A tip led to a Mississippi motel, but Rogers had disappeared before police arrived. 
Police issued an APB locally. They hoped someone would spot the suspected killer before he left the area. Days later, on November 3rd, 1995, Jackson, Mississippi detectives responded to a murder. Family members had found Linda Price dead in her bathtub. The 34-year-old single mother had been stabbed repeatedly and her throat had been slashed. Investigators searched the apartment for evidence. Technicians photographed the scene and lifted numerous latent fingerprints. They found no murder weapon. No valuables seemed to be missing. There was no apparent forced entry, and the killer had locked the door when leaving. The details of the crime scene led Jackson homicide detectives to conclude Linda Price had been killed by someone she knew. In the morning, they interviewed her mother. Perhaps she knew the killer as well. She said her daughter had a new boyfriend. His name was Glenn Rogers. A month earlier, on October 3rd, Linda had met Rogers at the Mississippi State Fair where he had been working. He was charming, and Linda fell for him right away. They soon rented an apartment and moved in together. At first, Linda seemed happier than ever, but recently she wondered if she'd made a mistake. She told her mother that Rogers had a bad temper and she feared his mood swings. When Linda stopped calling and didn't answer her apartment door, her mother believed that Rogers had harmed her. Again, Rogers was nowhere to be found. Jackson detectives believed he had left the area. They entered his name into the NCIC database. Learning Rogers was wanted for murder in California, they contacted Detective Mike Koblenz in Los Angeles. Jackson, Mississippi at that time contacted me, informed me of a murder they had, and they wanted more information on Glenn Rogers as he was a possible perpetrator in that case. The murders followed a pattern. The victims in California and Mississippi had both been charmed by Rogers. They had been isolated from others, then brutally killed just before Rogers fled the area. The investigators believed that Rogers was on a rampage that probably would not stop until he was found. In our minds, we knew that we had a major problem going on here. We felt if he wasn't apprehended, that there could very well be more victims. Jackson police asked the public to call if anyone saw Rogers in the area. Witnesses reported sightings, but Rogers stayed one step ahead of authorities. The detectives contacted the FBI field office in Jackson. Hey. They believed Rogers had left the state like he did after the California killing. Agents filed a federal warrant for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Perhaps federal resources could help stop the killer. FBI Special Agent John Huber helped coordinate the multi-state investigation. This case was very high speed, very fast. The murder he committed in Jackson was on November 3rd, it was Linda Price. Um, subsequent to that, he committed another murder on November 6th. 
On that date, police in Tampa, Florida, responded to a murder scene at a local motel room that had been rented by Glenn Rogers. Like Linda Price, the young woman lay dead in the bathtub, stabbed in the back, chest, and wrist. There was no ID of the woman in the room, but investigators noted a tattoo of a cross on her shoulder. Her jeans and shoes were piled near the toilet. A bracelet was found in the sink. From the evidence left behind, Tampa homicide detective Julie Masucci attempted to piece together the details of the murder. When we removed the clothing, it appeared that she had been stabbed through the clothing, which means that she was never undressed. Um, and it was from the rear portion, which appeared that someone might have come up behind her and stabbed her. The shoes had blood spots on the top, indicating she had them on and was standing when she was attacked. Under her body was a man's watch. Investigators believed it belonged to the killer. It was significant that she was placed in a bathtub and that it appeared that someone tried to clean up any evidence that they left behind. We had found towels to indicate someone had wiped up blood off of a floor. Um, it appeared that the bathtub water had been run to try and clean up any evidence that was left behind. The detective interviewed the housekeeper who discovered the body. That morning, she had been making her daily rounds just after checkout time. Outside room 119, she spotted a handwritten do not disturb sign. Housekeeping! She said she didn't clean the room the day before because she saw the sign and wanted to respect the privacy of the people staying there. On this day, the occupants were scheduled to have checked out. When she entered the bathroom, she made the gruesome discovery. Detectives asked the motel manager if she knew about the people staying in room 119. She recalled the man who rented the room because he requested a do not disturb sign the day before. They told him he didn't have one. So he paid for another night and told them at the registration that he did not want them cleaning his room. He wanted it to be left alone. Apparently, he went back to the room and tore off a piece of a phone book and made his own do not disturb sign, and he hung it on the door. The motel manager remembered the same man packing up a small white car that evening. He had paid for another night, so she didn't think he was leaving. She warned him about recent break-ins at the motel and told him not to leave anything in the car overnight. The detectives checked the office records, finding the registration card for room 119. It had Glenn Rogers' name and signature on it. Technicians would later recover prints matching Rogers from the car. Detective Masucci ran a computer check and saw the California and Mississippi murder warrants. She contacted the other agencies and the FBI. Then we started to realize very quickly into the investigation that there was a possibility that this man, Mr. Glenn Rogers, was a serial killer. The investigators knew who the killer was, but Tampa detectives still had not identified the female victim. She remained at the morgue as Jane Doe. If they could identify her, it might help them find the man who had killed her 
and at least two others. In the fall of 1995, after linking murders in California, Mississippi, and Florida to one man, the FBI and local detectives searched for accused serial killer, Glenn Rogers. The latest victim had been found in a Tampa motel room. She was still unidentified. Responding to media coverage, a woman whose daughter had been missing for two days came forward. She positively identified the body of her daughter, Tina Marie Cribs. Tina had two children of her own. Tina's mother told Detective Julie Masucci about her daughter's last day. We learned that Tina had worked and that she went to the Showtime Bar, which is in Gibsonton, and she met some friends there. She was supposed to meet her mother there. Apparently it's like a family bar where a lot of people go and, and there's televisions in there and they just go and gather and talk. Detectives visited the Showtime bar. The bartender said she knew Tina and her mother. She confirmed that Tina had been in the bar on November 5th. The bartender also remembered that a man named Glenn was there the same night talked with Tina and the others. He bought a round of drinks with a $100 bill. The bartender said the man was very friendly and won Tina over quickly. Eventually, he asked Tina for a ride home. He said his motel room was close and promised Tina would be back in time to meet her mother. Everything's taken care of, right? Tina finally agreed and told the others she'd be right back. When the mother came to the Showtime bar, she sat there and waited, and her daughter didn't show up. So she said she started beeping her to find out where she was. And she said that she had such a close-knit relationship with her daughter that she immediately knew something was wrong when she didn't answer her pages. Detective Masucci also learned that Tina owned a white Ford Festiva, the same kind of car the Tampa motel manager had seen Rogers packing with suitcases. She updated the NCIC report on Rogers, adding the Festiva and its license plate number to the fugitive's information. FBI Special Agent John Huber was surprised that Rogers wasn't trying to conceal himself. Glenn Rogers seemed to not care if he would get caught or had no fear of the law. He would always use his real name when dealing with people and checking into motels. He would drive cars that weren't stolen, either belonged to the, to the victim, which he could easily be linked to, or his own vehicle. Uh, he was a, he didn't seem to care. If people knew what was happening, he wasn't trying to hide. The search for the serial killer hit the news. TV stations across the Southeast broadcast pictures of Rogers, asking anyone spotting him to call authorities. Hundreds of leads poured into the FBI. One promising tip came from a Jackson, Mississippi motel. Two separate callers claimed to have seen Rogers there. Rogers had been in Jackson previously and was known to frequent small motels. We uh, set up a perimeter around the hotel and then we had an entry team go up to the door. Police, come to the door! Come to the door with your hands up! Come to the door! Hands where we can see you! Put your hands up! Come on! Come on! Agents were cautious until they could identify the man. We identified the person that resembled Rogers and determined that it was not him. We then later searched the entire hotel and began searching the hotels in the immediate vicinity, but uh, didn't find him. It was 
very important in this case to apprehend this individual as soon as possible because based on his history, he was going to continue to kill until he was apprehended. Authorities were desperate to stop him. The serial killer was out there somewhere, and it was likely that he was searching for his next victim. In the fall of 1995, suspected serial killer Glenn Rogers had been last seen in Florida. The FBI believed he had murdered a woman there after killing women in California and Mississippi. The FBI soon learned that Louisiana had been his next stop. On November 10, 1995, Andy Sutton, the mother of four, was found murdered in her Bossier City, Louisiana apartment. Like two others, she had multiple stab wounds to her upper body and back. The Bossier City detective questioned the victim's roommate and former boyfriend. Andy's roommate was a waitress and had worked late the night before Andy was killed. When she returned home in the early morning hours, she heard the bedroom door close. She assumed it was Andy and her new boyfriend, Glenn Rogers, in the apartment's one bedroom. Blankets had been left on the couch, and so she slept there. After daybreak, she was awakened by someone at the apartment door. Would you tell Andy I'm here? It was Andy's ex-boyfriend. He wanted to talk to Andy. I don't care. I'd still like to see In the room, she found Andy's body under the sheet. She told detectives Andy had met Glenn Rogers in a bar. They had been dating for only a few days. Neighbors had seen Rogers leave in a white festiva. Bossier City detectives ran Rogers' name through the NCIC and saw the three other murder warrants. They contacted the other police agencies in the FBI. Los Angeles faxed a photo of Rogers to be used in the local investigation. Louisiana television stations picked up the story. Viewers were asked to be on the lookout for Rogers, but they were warned not to approach the deadly fugitive. Special Agent John Huber and the other investigators were frustrated. Yeah, you know it. Rogers was killing people faster than we could investigate where he, where he was. Uh, it was just a, a kind of a time game and he was killing people faster than we could apprehend him. The FBI and local detectives believed Rogers murdered four women in six weeks. After each killing, Rogers had fled the state. The locations he chose were random. Despite their best efforts, investigators couldn't keep up. They needed to spread the description of Rogers and his vehicle across the country. Agents sent requests to truckers over their CBs to be on the lookout for a white Ford Festiva. They posted wanted flyers in truck stops and rest areas. We're not really sure where he's going to go next. That's why uh, they held press conferences to get Rogers' photo out to the public. They wanted to warn potential victims and hoped someone would spot the killer. 
Through the media, agents released details of Rogers' M.O. for finding victims and the route he traveled. Gallagher was viciously raped and murdered. The FBI began the process of adding Rogers to their 10 most wanted list. Getting someone on the 10 most wanted list increases the amount of resources that the Bureau puts into a case. It also uh, increases the amount of media attention that's also uh, worked into a case. The tips began to increase. One caller claimed Glenn Rogers was at a pool hall in Mississippi. Two agents responded. One of the pitfalls of an intense media campaign are the many false sightings that well-intentioned citizens call in. The man in the bar was obviously not Rogers. The investigators tried to predict Rogers' next move and focus their search. Special Agent Huber had worked plenty of fugitive cases. A lot of times in fugitive investigations, when people are in trouble, they'll go to areas that they're familiar with or, or associates or friends. In this particular case, Roger's family and friends were mostly located in the Kentucky area, and that's where a lot of our resources were focused. Authorities in Kentucky received priority teletypes about the fugitive. Kentucky State Police Detective Bob Stevens was already familiar with the name Glenn Rogers. In fact, he'd been looking for him for almost two years. Rogers was wanted for questioning in the disappearance and possible murder of his housemate, 71-year-old Mark Peters. Almost two years before Glenn Rogers' cross-country crime spree began, his brother had called the Kentucky State Police. The body had been found inside his family's cabin. Police believed it was Mark Peters. Peters had last been seen with Rogers. The cord tied around the corpse's hands and feet matched one found in the home the men shared. Authorities could not determine the cause of death, and they couldn't find Rogers. The case is still ongoing and still pending. Uh, we had one suspect, which was Glenn Rogers. We weren't able to track Rogers real well uh, due to the fact that he traveled by. Uh, Greyhound bus, by tractor trailer, uh, cars, it was hard for us to track him. Uh, so we had a hard time trying to know where his next step was. Still, the investigative focus in Kentucky paid off. On November 13, 1995, Glenn Rogers visited one of his relatives in Lee County, Kentucky. When he left, she called the Kentucky State Police. Hi, I think you're looking for my nephew. Glenn Rogers. She said he was driving a small white car heading west toward Interstate 75. When Detective Stevens heard that Rogers was sighted nearby, he set up on the road he believed Rogers would take to I-75. It wasn't long before a white Ford Festiva drove by. The detective began following. I wanted to make sure that this was Glenn Rogers, not somebody else that I had actually fallen in behind. So I pulled out behind this car. When I ran the car tags, the car tags actually came back stolen. So I began to follow him. I was able to get up, pull up beside him like I was going to pass. When I looked over, I could see who it was, and it, the picture I had of Glenn Rogers matched the driver.
the detective requested backup. A local police officer was parked nearby. He joined the slow pursuit. They followed Rogers for a distance. I think he was kind of watching me and I was watching him. And I think by then he must have pretty much figured out that he had, he had a police officer behind him. So uh, we pulled up to a stoplight and he ran the stoplight uh, and pretty much ran some people off the road as he was going through a, the stoplight. I fell in behind him at that time and activated my emergency equipment. Rogers didn't stop, he sped up. He's on to us now. Stand by. Several miles ahead, police set up a roadblock and tried to clear the road of traffic. They hoped this would be the last stop for the elusive killer. On November 13th, 1995, Kentucky State Police set up a roadblock in an effort to apprehend suspected serial killer Glenn Rogers. Armed officers waited at the roadblock. Shoot his tire! Shoot his tire! They fired at his tires, but they didn't stop the killer. Detective Bob Stevens was close behind. We followed him down the road. Uh, he had run several cars off the highway, ran a school bus off the highway. He was driving on the wrong side of the highway. And so it was determined that he had to be stopped. Sergeant Barnes would have to get up the other side of him. And when he came back, he tapped him, spun him out of the highway, off the highway into a ditch. They didn't know if the fugitive was armed. When I first approached the car, and I was one of the first ones to approach the car, uh, he, you could see that he, he looked very uh, upset, very um, aggravated that he was in the custody. He was uh, very defiant and just didn't want to be taken into custody at that time. After a two-month killing spree that spanned the country and left four women dead, Glenn Rogers was finally in custody. The vehicle identification number of the white Festiva confirmed the car belonged to Tina Marie Cribs, the victim in Florida. Technicians scoured the car for evidence. They found shorts with blood on them blanket and a woman's purse. These and other items linked Rogers to the murders in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Florida. Tell me a little bit about what you guys have. The FBI served as the clearinghouse for the evidence. FBI agents and detectives from the five states met in Kentucky to outline the case. Special Agent John Huber helped plan the meeting. What they did do was put together all the information that everyone had, share information, and also that the FBI laboratory would process all the evidence in this case so that one agency would have custody of all the evidence and do the analysis. Agents and detectives agreed that their best case against Rogers was in Florida. Tampa detective Julie Masucci met with detectives and prosecutors to review the evidence. They believed the watch found in the tub with the victim belonged to Rogers. A photograph of Rogers with Mississippi victim Linda Price revealed he wore that type of watch. Detective Masucci was confident in her case due to the physical evidence implicating Rogers. We had Tina Cribb's car that he was apprehended in. We had some shorts that belonged to him 
that had some of T Tina Cribb's DNA on them, the registration slip that Mr. Rogers signed himself, fingerprints that were found inside of motel room number 119 where the victim was found, and miscellaneous items that were found inside of the car when he was apprehended. On July 11th, 1997, almost two years after the murder of Tina Marie Cribbs in a Tampa motel room, Glenn Rogers was convicted of first-degree murder and later sentenced to death in Florida. Two years later, Rogers was extradited to Los Angeles to stand trial for the strangulation death of Sandra Gallagher, whose body was burned in a truck fire. He poured over the victim's body and in the cab of the truck. He was seen... Prosecutors outlined the victim's final hours for the jury. They showed that Sandra and Glenn Rogers left McRed's bar together on September 28, 1995. At some point, there was a struggle, perhaps as Rogers made an unwanted sexual advance. He strangled her, crushing her windpipe. Attempting to destroy evidence, Rogers doused Sandra's body in the truck with gasoline and set it ablaze. Then he ran. On July 16, 1999, a jury again found Glenn Rogers guilty of murder. He was sentenced to a second death penalty in the state of California.